On this edition of IMSHA News, you're going to hear from a bulldozer operator who found himself sucked into a void on a feeder draw hole of a raw coal stockpile. Because of the safety features his company installed after a previous accident, Roger is alive to tell us his story. The piles were way up big and was probably somewhere in the area of about uh, 15 to 20 foot from the top of the truck dump where the trucks were, they were coming in and, and dumping and uh, the feeders uh, weren't opening. One of them opened, number three feeder opened. So I was basically trying, taking the coal from uh, the, what the trucks were dumping and pushing it to the number three feeder and more or less trying to keep the truck drivers happy, keep them hot moving and, and keep a little bit of coal coming to the plant. And I'd clean away from, clean as much as I could away from the wall and then I'd go back at digging at the number four feeder, trying to open it up. Really there was more coal coming in than I could get rid of in one feeder. So it piled up on me pretty good. So I started cutting towards, you know, cutting the pile away from the wall again towards the number three feeder because it was getting in my way of digging out the number four. And the number four feeder had rat holed out and I was, I just had pushed up to the number three feeder and went to reverse and when I started to move backwards a big cloud of dust started rolling and the dozer turned to the side, went into the feeder on its side. I guess the blade or whatever, something turned, to let the dozer turn back around to where it was just sitting on its tail like that. And after the dust cleared, I had about maybe two foot of window that I could still see out of. And when I looked out, it was like I was in a jug. Everything was just over top of the dozer and I was looking out through a hole. So I just, you know, I just stayed, you know, stayed where I was at. I started hollering at the control room operator and told him to shut the feeders off on the FM radio. I grabbed hold of the seat and pulled it forward as far as I could get it. I turned around backwards, put my back up against the window and pulled the pin on the, the self-rescuer door and dropped it out and got it. I'd shut the dozer off other than I left the, the air conditioning fan running. So if, you know, if there was any air around the machine, you know, I could uh, draw off of it rather than just worrying about the rescuer. Um, and basically, you know, just, just sit there. I think they said I was in there for like an hour and 45 minutes. Uh, I was in my office and was informed by the plant foreman. Uh, we immediately got in a pickup truck and came to the stockpile on top where we could see what was going on. We got to the top, looked down, we could see the void in the, in, in the pile, and we could see the blade of the dozer about five or six feet below the surface of the coal. We were able to communicate with the, uh, with the operator. We could talk to him, and uh, he told us he was okay. Uh, he could see light, uh, and we told him what we were going to do. We, were, we called the loadout and got two more dozers up to the pile. And we immediately began moving a coal away from him. And when we started moving a coal away, the pile started breaking and, and it covered the dozer at that time to where he couldn't see. So he, uh, he had his self-rescuer out and had it ready. Nothing really fell in until I could feel the other dozer. He'd, he'd come in on the, start coming in on the pile. And when he did it, uh, everything jarred loose and it finally it covered the dozer up. Almost positive that I could keep what was going to come through that window out. You know, and if I stayed where I was at, that the cab of the dozer wasn't going to fill up with coal. When I, I first went in, I still had about, about that much window. And as this things progressed, the, the window was getting slowly but surely covered up. And then finally it was, uh, the window covered up and then I felt the, the pile give and you feel the dozer move. It was just kind of a thud. And then I knew that the rest of the pile would come in on top of it. With communication, I could talk Roger all the time while I was climbing on the pile. And the time I got to the 
where he was at to the top. Then I, I was above him so I could look down and see the blade and part of the cab. And then I talked to him and I proceeded to start digging him out. The man has a lot of time to think when he's, when he's actually that close to death. I just stayed real calm and tried to control myself enough to where I didn't get real excited and thought about my kids and my wife. The glass was already breaking in as crushing through the doors and they basically just had to finish breaking the glass out. I just told Mr. Bubba, just get me out of here. And he grabbed me by the shoulders and pulled me through the door. Coal stockpiles probably is the most dangerous situation that we have in the coal industry today. We did a lot of things after the first accident, which was in the clean coal pile. We created some more ideas by having the trucks to stop dumping, concentrating on the one feeder that was giving us a problem. When the man was rescued, we came back to the, to the stockpiles and we started evaluating. And at that time, we put balls directly above the feeders to mark exactly where the feeder was so when the stockpile would be high that, that we would know underneath because when the piles get high you'd have no way to real, really tell exactly where it's at but the ball hanging directly over helps it. We also installed lights of telling us which feeder was running. That would give all outside personnel that would be on the property would not be familiar with this operation. They would know which feeders are running so that they would know which ones to stay away from. Also we went inside our tunnels at the feeder where the draw holes inside. We placed switches that would automatically cut the feeder off if the coal would quit feeding down. If it would go empty, that would be plucked, plugged off so we would know it was blocked. It would automatically shut the feeder off. We put cameras on the stockpile so we could monitor the dozers. We have three different radio communications in the dozer so that the man, if one radio would fail or antenna was knocked off, he would still have radio communication with someone because he has with the supervisor, he has with other mobile equipment, and he has with the control room. So that gives him the communication to be able to get a hold of someone. Each dozer on the job, we have a self-rescuer that is located in a compartment directly above the operator's head so that he doesn't have to look for it. Pulls it down, there's a flashlight and the self-rescuer is located in a compartment where it's easy access to the operator of the equipment. It's part of the operator's job each day when he checks his equipment out, he has a, a pre-op checklist. He also checks to make sure that this hasn't been tampered with, hasn't been opened, hasn't been used, so that way he knows that it's in good shape. He has a pin flashlight kept in there so that he'll be, have light in case of darkness. Some of the operators even go as far enough to go ahead and even store extra sets of batteries for the flashlight to have it. This is in each piece of equipment that we have to assure that the operator will have this self-rescuer to be able to use. We added extra glass into the dozer. We got a special glass that's made big, bigger than the opening that's supposed to be. It won't cave in, but you can kick it out if you're, if you're fouled in the dozer. In the event that you have stockpiles get large, you have weather changes, you have dozers working, and you're not running a pile, but you have to push the coal, then you are going to get feeders that will be plugged up, and you have to go back and open them. But the main concern is to be sure that we're safe when we do it and have every possible means of making sure that we don't get someone hurt or get someone in a feeder. You get into a situation like that, you, you kind of look at you know, what's going what's to help me survive longer. You know, if, uh, staying calm is going to uh, conserve the air that's in the cab. Stay calm. If you're on that stockpile and you see you're going down a hole, sit tight. Absolutely do not get out of that dozer. Uh, don't even attempt it because if you try to get out of that thing and, uh, and get behind it or under it or coal falls on you, there's no chance for you. Stay. Stay in the dozer because if you come out, you may go through the feeder. You may get under the dozer. You don't know, we don't know how to dig for you. If, you. if you're out of the cab, we don't know how to shove or push forward to try to get you out. Stay in the dozer. I believe if you stay in it, you'll stay alive. When we have this problem on the stockpile and we know the feeder's plugged, we're very, very much leaning toward the remote control dozer to open that hole up with not having a, a human in it. So it, it will happen and it'll happen again. I know it will. Somewhere in the country, somebody will get in a coal pile with a, with a piece of equipment.
In the last 10 years, there have been four fatalities involving bulldozers falling into surge piles. Some of these fatalities could have been prevented if the safety ideas presented in this video were followed. Charts can be used to indicate the stockpiled material's angle of draw and to suggest the safest working distance from the draw hole. Remember, the higher the surge pile, the larger the hidden void can be. Report unsafe and hazardous working conditions and share safe working ideas with your supervisor and coworkers to help eliminate surge pile fatalities. Additional surge pile safety information is available on MSHA's webpage.